Good morning. I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, those of you in the chapel, as well as those of you watching online, to our worship service, the Sunday after Easter. We're thrilled that you're here. We had a family join the church at 9 o'clock. The uh, Eric and Bree, uh, or excuse me, Eric and Briar Doherty, and their two children are Owen and Lyra. And they took the vows of church membership and became a member of the chapel, and we're delighted to have them. Look for them and uh, greet them and let them know that we're thrilled to have them as a part of the chapel. Linda, come and share with us about Stand Around. Uh, many of you have experienced Stand Around just a few minutes ago, and those of you who may not know what that is, Linda will tell us, then she will lead us in our call of confession. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, yep. I'm a part of a ministry that we call Stand Around, and isn't that a fun name? When we first joined the chapel, I thought, hmm, Stand Around, <laughs> and it made perfect sense for me, but it's a, it's a great honor to be a part of that because I see so many people enjoying fellowship, sharing with one another, business gets taken care of during Stand Around, and so on. Um, there are four members in my group, um, John and Linda Fight have been with this ministry probably for 13, 15 years. And I've been a part of it for six or seven. And we also have Mary Lou Stevens, who joined us a couple years ago. And then just last year, Mary George joined us. But we've lost one member recently, so I'm looking for a replacement if anybody um, would be interested. And what it involves is, you know, we offer hospitality 50 or 51 times a year, depending upon how the Sundays fall. And um, what we do, one of us on the team is there every Sunday to kind of oversee and help the hosts. And I usually um, am responsible for making sure that we have hosts available. And if we have a number of people, like 26, that, that means that two times a year we would ask you to host Stand Around. It's fun. What I, another thing I like about it is I've gotten to know so many people individually because we got to spend time together while the coffee was brewing and the cookies were out and all of that. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, there are other ministries like the ushers that every Sunday, you know, we need for both services a number of ushers in. Um, Jeannie Martin is in charge of that. I, I kind of tried to calculate how many vol volunteers it takes to, to, to provide a wonderful worship experience. And a minimum of 30, I would say, not counting on the choir and so on. And so we need help from just about everybody. And if hosting stand around is not your thing, I always say there's all kinds of ways to um, serve the Lord and to serve in any other kind of ministry. So... It's fun for me, and it's fun for my team members, and I, I just know that it's an important part of, of, of what we do, and I, the Lord wants us to fellowship together, and that's, that's part of what we do. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a little update on that, and remember, we need all kinds of help, every, not only us and our team, but ushers and others. So with that, would you please join me in the prayer of, stand and join me in the prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Be seated, please. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Come in a little closer, please. I see we've got some objects here. And what do you have for us, Owen? What would you bring? The Bible. A Bible. Okay, and what? tell me what the Bible is to you. God's book. Very good. Very good. And, Laura, what did you bring? A flower. A flower. Can I see it? What does this flower remind you of? Um, day and summer. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> do you... Uh, Oh, we've got something else there, okay. What do we have here? What is that? An egg. An egg. I've never seen an egg with a string coming out of it. <laughs> Tell me about this egg. Um, it kind of represents like the birth of Jesus. Okay, all right. Okay, and you've got something for me? What, what is that? Can I see? What a is coin. This? A coin. Let's see, is that, uh, what, is it, what does that say? Can you tell? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what that says on it? What's that say? One cent. One dollar. Okay. Let's see. It, one, that, no, one, yeah, one, yeah, one dollar. Because. That's yeah. a dollar sign? Okay. And why did you bring this today? My brother just gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother just gave it to you. Well, that's a pretty good, pretty good reason. You got any ideas about what we can learn from these items that you brought? Yes. The the egg. It represents e Easter. Right. Okay, and <laughs> you're right, you're right. And anything else you want to tell me about that? Um, it's when Jesus rose from the dead. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. Do you have, you have something? Okay. It kind of represents like the birth of life. Exactly, exactly. That's terrific. And that's all told about in what book, Owen? Um... The, what, what is the book you're holding? Oh, the Bible. The Bible. There we go. Thank you. Yes, yes. You want to say something? And, and the Bible can teach you about God. Exactly. It certainly can. Well, let's pray together, okay? Dear God. Dear God. We thank you. We thank you. That the Bible tells us about you. That the Bible tells us about you. And we thank you. And we thank you. For the egg. Egg. And for the other reminders, and for the other reminders that remind us of new life in you. And remind us in new life in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Let me give you the egg back. And there's your coin that your brother gave you. Okay. <laughs> Would you join me in prayer, please? Almighty God, it is such a joy to come into your house. It is such a sacred privilege to experience one another. It is such a marvelous, happy time to have fellowship with those who call your holy name as Lord and Savior. Wow, Lord, to be at Big Canoe Chapel to experience love, to experience forgiveness, and to experience Holy Communion. We thank you that you gave your body and shed your blood for us. We thank you for the resurrection that we celebrated not only last Sunday, that we celebrate every Sunday and indeed every day of our lives. We thank you that through the resurrection, we can be resurrected over those concerns that burden our hearts, over those comments or questions or situations that 
burden our minds over those concerns that we do not know what to do. Resurrect us, Lord, and help us always to keep our eyes upon you. Even as the familiar song says, turn our eyes upon you, Lord Jesus, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Help us to do that. Because in the world, Lord, as you know better than us, there are a lot of things that make us want to dim our vision, that want to extinguish hope, that want to bring about discouragement and disappointment. But help us to experience the resurrection vision that comes only from you, so that as we keep our eyes upon you, we see that which you want us to see, and that we treat each other as you want us to treat each other, and that we love all as you have loved all. Let that be so, Lord Jesus. Forgive us of our sins. Initiate us into a new life beginning on this day as a little child reminds us that a little simple artificial egg can remind us of new life in you. Initiate that new life in each one of us, Lord Jesus, those in this chapel and those who worship by means of live stream. For we offer our prayer in your holy, righteous, wonderful name. Amen.
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for every opportunity you give us to be on the receiving end of your goodness and grace. And Father, thanks so much for the opportunity even now to be part of giving back to you. And we do so in worship. So Father, thank you for the gift. Please multiply it. And thanks for blessing those who have given. Lord, let this be an expression, not just of worship, but of our commitment to you. And so, Father, in all of this, thank you for allowing us to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. It's my privilege to add to the greeting you've already heard this morning. So glad you're here. Uh, we haven't officially introduced or welcomed our guest musicians, and it's my privilege this morning to do so. Uh, Dr. Elena, thank you so much. We're honored you're here. Allison, always great to have you here. Thanks for your ministry. Uh, would you express a, a sincere appreciation for them? And I really do hope you'll have an opportunity before you leave and before they do to say thank you and greetings. Glad you're here. Those of you online, we're so grateful you're here. We're worshiping together uh, Sunday after Easter. So many great things. I hope you're having a great day and a great week. We're going to spend some time this morning. I do have a question before we go any further, and it's, it's kind of a personal question. If I had a chance to see you one-on-one, -on -one, I'd probably feel more comfortable in doing this, and so don't feel like you've got to answer this out loud. But here's my question. Are there any Bible characters that you tend to like or gravitate to 
better than others? Don't answer the question, but it really helps you start thinking about Old Testament, New Testament. One reason I'm asking that question, because at certain times of the year, like this time, there are some characters or some stories from the Bible that, that are happening in the Scripture and kind of at our own timing here. For example, last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection. There are several passages of Scripture. There are several individuals that when you read that, it's almost like in real time. The passage we're going to look at this morning is taking place very soon, if not almost immediately after the resurrection. So it's, it's one of those things as you look at it, it's like, well, that was taking place as we celebrate it now. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you in just a minute that you find the last chapter of the book of John, John chapter 21. We'll look at a couple of verses there. There's a lot of things going on in that chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it does give us an opportunity just to celebrate some of the things that literally took place even real life, real time now. See, this passage that we're going to read in just a minute comes immediately after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Just imagine being in the same vicinity as the resurrected Jesus. That's part of what's going on here. But also, this story that we're going to be glancing at in just a minute features Peter. One reason I like to look at Peter is because he, I'm not saying that I can identify him with so much. I like Peter because he makes a lot of commitments. He says one thing, but then what happens for a lot of times, he kind of goes off and does his own thing. Now you kind of know where I am. So without trying to put me down or talk about anyone else, I kind of relate to Peter at times. One thing about Peter in this story, you'll remember, if you've ever read anything in Scripture, Peter was one of those who dearly loved the Lord, made a lot of commitments. He followed the Lord, and his life was completely transformed by that. But just before the, Jesus was arrested, just before the crucifixion, Peter said to the Lord and to other disciples, um, I will... I will die for you, Lord. I will give that kind of commitment to you. I remember Jesus saying, this is recorded in Scripture, I believe in your love, Peter, but you won't make it through the night. You'll deny me three times. That's just one of those stark moments. So without trying to point at me and necessarily point at you, can you relate to any of that? I'm not saying that you commit. I'm not saying that you failed. I'm not trying to say any of that, but it's just kind of interesting. Now that I look back at a story like that, it's like, yeah, somehow I kind of relate. Then in just a minute, we're going to read this passage and begin to realize that Jesus, the resurrected Christ, is now in their midst. We'll look at that in just a minute. What makes this so personal? is that Jesus starts asking Peter, and I think, and me, and maybe you, some of the most pointed questions that have ever been asked. Matter of fact, why don't we go ahead and look at the passage. It's John chapter 21. If you have your Bible or not, I'm going to ask now, would you stand? It's in reference to the reading to the Scripture. All I'm going to do at this point is read verses 15, 16, and 17. Friends, this is God's word. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus then said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Jesus then said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before you sit down, let's pray together. Lord, we, um, 
we come to you, the risen Savior. We come to you, the one who's in charge of all, who knows everything. And Father, we humbly hear you ask, not just Peter, but ask us some of the most pointed questions. We do so in worship, but we need to hear you speak as only you can. Hide me behind the cross, Father. These dear folks have not come to hear me. We've come to hear from the Master, and as only you can speak, your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, please. Um, Friends, I'm I'm not going to read through the longer passage. Is that all right with you? Please say amen. It's a long... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I'm hearing that. But one reason I love this passage, it does come immediately after the resurrection. It does feature Jesus. It does feature Peter. Now, hold on just a minute because I'm not trying to put anyone down. Peter is the one who had a strong love and commitment to the Lord Jesus himself and had done that for years. His life was completely and radically changed. I'm going to ask you kind of a general question. Can you relate to that? Have you ever said to Jesus, I serve you, I love you, no matter what? Now, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. It's just, it's very personal. But you know, there's another reason I love this passage, and then we're talking about Peter. Peter is one who just before the, the, Jesus was um, um, not just crucified, but before he... He was, um, this this was a tough time. Peter literally says, I will die for you, Jesus. My commitment level is way up here. And Jesus says, I believe that, but you won't make it through the night. You'll deny me three times. I can't imagine Peter hearing that before it happened. And so I'm not sure how long it took, let's say from that moment until Jesus was crucified, until Jesus was raised from the dead, and then to this moment but it probably was no more than about a couple of days. Something tells me Peter was already living with this heavy guilt and grief, the fact that he had denied his master. So one reason I love this passage is now you have the resurrected Jesus on the scene. You have Peter who has lived with his love and his commitment to the Lord, but he's also living with this Look at how I messed up. So if you'll give me just a minute, let me tell you a little bit what's going on in the first part of John chapter 21. I'm doing this for my sake. Remember, Peter was a fisherman. Anybody remember that? He was good at that. That was his profession. And the first time that Peter ever encountered Jesus early in Jesus' ministry, Peter and his entourage had been fishing all night long. Anyone remember how much, how, if, did they catch any fish? No, not on that occasion. And that, that would have shaken me up. I love to fish. I don't do very much of it. But if I ever go over here to the lake and I, and I fish and I don't catch anything, I'm thinking, this is recreational. But if I had to live off of that, it's a little bit different. So here you have Peter who was that professional fisherman listening to someone who was not a professional fisherman saying, let me tell you how to do it. Jesus tells Peter how to fish. Now that throws me off. And then all of a sudden, Peter does what Jesus says. Anybody remember, did did Peter indeed catch any fish at that point? I mean, it's a massive amount. Matter of fact, I don't know if it says how many, but they... It started tearing the nets, and it probably started tilting the boat over. That would shock me immensely. Now, fast forward. Let's say about three years. The same thing is happening. It's not retelling another. It's not retelling the story. It is a different story. Peter and some of the disciples say, "Let's go back to fishing." I'm not sure if I really like what we've got. What we've got ourselves into. Let's go back to fishing. They fished all night long. Anybody remember, did they catch anything that time? No, not a thing. But Jesus had shown up, and Jesus says, let me tell you how to fish. He said, follow my instructions. So they do. You know the story. Cast the nets over. 
Now, at that point, did they catch anything with Jesus' instructions? In this case, it says they, they told the, the amount. I mean, it's a huge amount of fish. Now, I'm not sure about you. I'm trying to put myself in Peter's position. That's actually hard for me to do. I, I don't mean as a fisherman. I don't mean as a follower of, of Jesus. But something's going on here that reminds me this is the same Jesus who said to me earlier, I want you to now not just catch fish, I want you to catch people. There's something that's greatly reminding us about who Jesus is. Well, one reason I love this passage, John chapter one, uh, 21, this gives us the, the opportunity to, to revisit Jesus, now the resurrected Jesus. And I think it does give us an opportunity to put ourselves in Peter's position for a minute. So here's, here's the story. Now, almost go back to the three verses we just read. One reason I love this passage, Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, is now talking to Peter very personally, and he asks three questions. You've already heard this. If you have your Bible in front of you, you can tell me now. Anybody remember what the first question was? Peter, do you do you love me? Now, I don't, I don't mean to brush that off. Peter had already made the commitment and had proven this over and over again, probably one of the closest disciples that, that Jesus ever had. So I think Jesus knew the question. He knew the answer. But here's part of what kind of threw me off. Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me like God loves you? It is that word, the agape. Do you love me like that? Now, I'm not sure how I would have answered, no matter what. But here's how Peter answers the question. You've already heard this. You know where I'm headed. That, so the answer that Peter gives to Jesus, well, you know I love you. Is that right? Something like that? Actually, Peter uses a different word. I don't mean to put him down, but he, asks, he answers Jesus' question with a whole different perspective. Jesus says, do you love me like God loves you? Peter answers, well, you know I like you. You, you know I, I really hold you in high esteem. And for me to hear that, I don't think that's a lie. But it just, it's almost, I'm not sure how I would have answered that. I like you a whole lot, Jesus. Let me back up for just a minute because there's something else that Jesus says in that first question. Peter do you love me more than these? Now, did you read that in the scripture? Okay. I don't even know what all he meant by that. Was he talking about the other disciples? Possibly. Do you love me more than, than these? Peter had already told Jesus, and them, I love you probably more than anyone you can imagine. That's, that's part of the story. But I also wonder if maybe Jesus was saying to Peter, do you love me more than all these fish? I mean, this is a great deal of fish. Do you love me, Peter, when things are going great, when there seems to be an abundance? I'm not sure how I would. Actually, I do know how I would answer. I love Jesus. I really do. But I sure think I love him a lot more when things are going really good. I mean, I can't help but do that. Don't, don't be so critical. That's just, that's just how I am. And maybe some of us are as well. So it's not a critical thing. But for Jesus to ask the question, do you love me more than these, hits me. Okay, that was the first question. Do you love me like God loves you? Oh, yeah, I, I really like you. <laughs> now, the, not only is there a question, not only is there an answer, but what happens here is where I get caught up in the, in the moment because Jesus says this, feed my lambs. I don't mean to try to figure all that out, but there's something very relational. There's something very caring when Jesus is saying to Peter or to anyone else, I want you to take care of my flock. I want you to take care... Because they're vulnerable, they're hurting, they're scattered and all that. Does that hear, do you hear that? Please say yes. <laughs> That's a scary thing to be, 
said by the masters. Okay, so we said there's three questions. Remember the first one, Peter, do you, do you love me? I don't think it's a harm. That's, that's not a bad question. Nor is the answer. But then there comes the second. Peter, do you, anybody remember the next one? Do you, do you love me? I mean, it sounds like the same question. As a matter of fact, Jesus is asking, the, the, using the same words, do you love me like God loves me? Do you love me like God loves you? Now, something's going through my mind. If I'm Peter, I'm thinking, this sounds familiar. And I don't mean to sound critical. But the response that Peter has in this case, Jesus, uh, Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? Here's how Peter answers that. I really like you, Jesus. I think you're way up there. I don't think that was a slam. I think that was as much as Peter knew how to answer in that moment. Now, don't hear me trying to put me or Peter or anyone else down. Yeah, there are times when I kind of hear that same question from Jesus. And he's saying, do you love me like I love you? And I can't help but start thinking, there's no way I could pull that together. But I really do like you, Jesus. I love being around you. I love being around your people. So the answer is very genuine. But the response that Jesus then has to Peter, and I think to me, and I think to you, he's saying something like this, do you, not only do you love me, but will you shepherd my sheep? A little bit different nuance than what he said, feed my lambs. So I'm not trying to get off on a tangent here, Pastor, but I think it does give me an opportunity to start. There is a big difference in just feeding, taking care of, but, you know, a shepherd is someone, you know, sheep have a tendency to scatter. The sheep have a tendency to begin to think if there's danger, they, they not only get afraid, they, they lose control. And a shepherd spends as much time building relationships so that there's a trust level. I'm scared about all of this because I'd, like, I'd much rather just feed them. <laughs> I like stand around. Anybody get that? <laughs> I don't think this is in my job description, but it feels like it is. If there's food, show up. I mean, I, I'm just, it's not just let's be together, but there's something remarkable about this. So now, all of a sudden, what Jesus says is, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, then, and Peter then responds, I really like you, and you've heard me say that. What was the invitation, the commission, the command that Jesus says to Peter? Shepherd my sheep. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I'm not going to try to put words necessarily in mine, but when I hear that, shepherd my sheep. There's a passage of scripture I've heard, maybe you have as well. If you don't mind, I'm going to start reading it because it helps me at this point to start thinking, God is the one who has shepherded us. So here's the statement. I think you've heard this before. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Something tells me Peter considers a passage like this, where it's not so much activity he has to do as reflect on how God is the one who does it. Does that help? Does that make sense? Please say, yes, I'm needing this at this moment. If you think that Peter had a hard time hearing Jesus ask the first two questions, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? 
Then here's a third question. I think you already know the answer. Peter? Yeah. I didn't realize this until I looked at it, not only in commentary and some other things, but here's, here's the third question that Jesus asked. Peter, do you even like me? Peter says, oh, you know, you know everything. You know I like you. You know I hold you in such high esteem. But what Jesus then does, he doesn't question, he doesn't say to Peter, you're not loving me enough. (laughs) You're not doing all the right things. He says to Peter, Feed my sheep. Friends, that's not just a professional assignment. That's not just for someone who has a title. That's for all of us who somewhere along the line come to the point and saying, I don't know if I can ever love you like you deserve, Father, but I sure do love you. I like you. I love what you've done for me. And so Jesus then says, I've got a job for you. Uh, maybe this is a hard question for me to ask, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. Do you think Jesus was intentional? Do you think Jesus had the right to ask Peter, do you love me? Do you think Jesus had the right to ask him a second time, do you really love me? Now I'm going to ask now the obvious question. Do you think Jesus had the right and the authority to look at Peter and say, but do you even like me. Friends, I'm not sure, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that hits me hard. See, Jesus had already proven, I love you more than you can imagine. I died for you. Those nails were not so much what held Jesus on the cross, it was his love for us. You've heard that before. That's not just a cliche. But now you have the risen Christ who stands in front of Peter and the others and says, I know you know that I love you. Now here's what I'm asking you to do. That's where we are today, my friends. Not so much the Sunday after Easter as it is. We get to be God's people and never feel like we measure up to the standard that Christ has given for us. And yet he accepts us and he gives us a remarkable job. See, in just a minute, don't be too surprised. We're going to be able to come as a congregation, as individuals, and come and hear Jesus say, this is my broken body. It is broken for you. It is Jesus literally saying, this is my blood that is shed for you. I've got a job for you. Receive my love, but share it with others. They're needing it, and so are we. I'm honored to be in a room with you to celebrate the message that's not just a question, do you love me, but it has been firmed that Jesus says, never forget, I love you. Never forget, I invite you to be part of kingdom work that blows our mind. I invite you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter your background, no matter how long or short you've known him, you're invited to the table. You're invited to receive and to share and to be among those. I'm not going to tell you what to do, friends, But if and when you come up here, hear the master say, I love you. And he gives you the opportunity to say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I love you and I want to love you more. Pastor, will you come? The invitation has been given. I'm going to ask you to lead us in prayer. We'll literally start this remarkable opportunity. I'm so glad you folks are here. Pastor, would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do hear your invitation to come and to receive your broken body and your shed blood. 
We hear your voice asking each one of us individually, do you love me? And let our response be deep from our heart and soul, yes, Lord, we do love you. We don't deserve this. We don't deserve anything. But thank you that you have loved us. And let us, as we participate in this ritual of Holy Communion and in the consecration of these elements, may we then receive you afresh. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Dr. Apple, would you lead us in the consecration ritual? And you see on your worship folder, I'm going to read, let's read together responsively. The Lord be with you. Lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All honor and praise and glory be to God. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, friends, will you join me and let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Jesus Christ, broken for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. This is the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for you and for me so that our sins may be forgiven, that we could receive forgiveness and also move toward perfection in this life. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and almighty God, we ask your blessing and your consecration upon these elements of bread and juice. We pray that they might become the body and blood of Jesus Christ so that we might become for the world his loving ambassadors. Let that be so, O Lord as we humbly come before you, confessing our sin, but also receiving your Holy Spirit so that we might be exactly who you want us to be in this chapel and in this world. In your holy name we pray, amen. I invite those persons who are going to share in assisting with Holy Communion to come at this time to this station.
Almighty God, we have experienced your broken body and your shed blood. We have felt your marvelous love. Our souls are cleansed. Help us, dear Lord, to now go and feed the sheep. To you, to be a person who goes for your agenda and not ours. Bless the Big Canoe Chapel and use this chapel to be a mighty force to lead all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.